I'm always looking for new way to use leftover cheese and I have always leftover cheese. Blue cheese, some goat cheese, some Swiss cheese, some camembert, any of those. And I put some dry cranberry or dry cherries in it. A piece of apple or a piece of pear. You, know, you can put it right in there. And you put that in your food processor and turn it long enough you know, to do a nice mush out of it which get thick enough like it is here so you can grab a little bowl out of it and roll it and you put pignolet nut in the oven or almond and you roll it in your pignolet nut to do a little cheese bowl and pignoli making this fast and easy recipe will build up your confidence I am Jacques Pépin this is fast food my way Happy cooking. Production funding for this series has been brought to you by Cuisinart, with the next generation of food processors. From bread dough, to pizza, to stir fries. We do the work to save you time. Cuisinart, the next generation. And by Scharfenberger, makers of fine artisan dark chocolates, recipes available at scharfenberger.com. And by Spectrum Organics, the purveyor of fine culinary oils and condiments. Spectrum, the taste of goodness. And by OXO Good Grips, makers of kitchen tools that make everyday living easier. Well, I'm doing an interesting menu today. It's actually not a menu. I'm going to start with Crick, what my mother used to call Crick, which are potato pancake that she used to serve with a salad and all that. And we always do that at home. Sometimes we do them at order with a little bit of smoked salmon on top, sour cream, sometimes caviar if you really want to splurge. So it can be very elegant or very, very simple, served with a salad. And then after that, we are going to do a chili con carne. And the chili con carne, of course, is uh, I'm going to serve it with lettuce and cheese and cilantro. But I wanted to show you how to use it to do it in a pressure cooker will save a great deal of time. Then we're going to do a kale, a crunchy kale, a way that my friend Jean-Claude told me to do the kale, which are very crunchy and uh, very easy to do. And then a dessert with uh, canned pear that I'm going to cook with apricot and, uh, and some butter. So it's a kind of eclectic menu, but uh, it's fun. So I'm going to start with the chili con carne and with the pressure cooker. You see, when, when you cook at, uh, at sea level, the pressure is such that is, the atmospheric pressure is such that the water gets to 212 degrees to crack open and start boiling. It needs 212 degrees. As you go higher and higher, you lose like, I forget exactly, two or three degrees per thousand feet of elevation. And sometimes it boils for hours and the cellulose, certain fiber in the meat or beans or whatever you have, don't really cook. So it cooks sometimes three, four, five, six hours, much longer than it would be at room uh, at sea level. So the pressure cooker does the opposite. It applies pressure on the food itself so that it needs to go to a temperature much higher than 212 before it starts boiling, the pressure point. So at that point, the fiber in beans or meat is broken very fast and it's a great day and uh, a way of cooking and a great way of keeping all the taste together and all that. And usually, you know, a stew in 20, 25 minutes, things which will take you two hours to do, so it's great. So this is the conventional one that you put on top of the stove and cook. I have another one here, which is an electric one. And it's great also, it's great for different reasons. It will take a bit longer than the other one to reach the pressure, but then you put the timer and it will only start timing when the pressure is on. So this is great because you can go to work or if you, you have to go shopping, you want to do that recipe, you put all your ingredients together I'm going to do, you put it on, on your timer and you can go. When it's finished, it will shut up automatically. So that's great. So here is what we have here. So you have an insert here in the non-stick, so we have beans, because chili con carne we do with beans. And here for like four people, I'm using like a good half a, half a pound of beans, you know, red beans, like this, which of course I'm going to rinse under water, there. So now people, in my case here, I mean, most of the time of the recipe tell you to pre-soak the beans and all that. I don't do any of this 
to do it this way. So it's the type of thing you can do at the last moment, you know, and it's fine. You know, it works quite, quite well. So we have the meat in there. I'm going to put a pound of meat, and this is kind of a ground meat. You can cut your meat with a knife into tiny dice if you want, or a kind of very coarse ground, you know, that's fine too. I have like three cups of water. We put in there for half a pound of beans. So we have uh, the salt in there that I'm going to put. And then all kind of seasoning. I have a can, 15 ounce of, uh, of tomato. You know, a couple of uh, tablespoon of tomato paste that I have in there. Mix it together. So everything is cold. It's an easy recipe to do. I'm putting like a tablespoon of unsweetened cocoa powder here to make it a little bit like a mole, what the Mexican call mole, you know? That's great. I'm putting a couple of tablespoons of olive oil in there, and then seasoning like bay leaf, a couple of bay leaf, a little bit of oregano. I love also Mexican oregano, or Greek oregano, it's really nice. And then cumin, like a tablespoon of uh, of cumin powder and of course chili powder, about a tablespoon of chili powder as well. Okay, make sure that you stir it well, you know, so the meat doesn't get lumpy. And then with that, we're going to have scallion, like about three quarters of a cup to a cup of scallion. I mean, when you do those things, it's not that exact, you know, you can have a bit more, a bit less. Scallion is fine in there. So certainly it's an easy dish to do. Then some chopped onion. And again, it can be very coarsely done as well. Like a good cup, two cup of it. I think I'll put the whole onion there. That's it. So I have onions. Now I want to do garlic. I'll crush it coarsely and we'll put it right like this directly into the beans. Okay, then jalapeno if you want. Jalapeno, it's always, you know, sometimes I cut it right all around the, the rib and the seed in the center, but because the rib and the seed, that's where really the big hotness here. Sometimes you want more or less. But still, I always take a little piece and kind of test it. Because sometimes they test about like green paper and the next time it just blow your mind. So uh, put as much as you like. It's purely a question of tolerance. I like it fairly hot. Do it very fine like this. And I think that I put everything that I want to put in there. Here it is. Good. Now I can clean up my mess this way. And cover this. So it goes only one way, you know, and close one way. You have no choice anyway. And this is the, where the steam is really the pressure. If you want to bend it like this, when it's really, really uh, uh, hot, then the pressure will release maybe in a minute. If you don't do anything, it will release in like 15, 20 minutes. Easy to use. Okay. Next, I'm going to do my crick, or that is little potato pancake that my mom used to do. And for that, I need a, a couple of tablespoons of, uh, a couple of cup rather, of potato in cube. And you know what we used to, sometimes I do it, I do those by uh, grating it on the box grater and it's fine. But sometimes I do it just like this. You know, putting everything in the food processor, it's another way of doing it. And uh, notice that I have peeled the potato and I kept them in water. But after I take them out of the water, I cut them now, I don't want to wash them at that point. If I wash them at that point, I will remove too much of the starch. You know? Now here it is, I can measure it. You know, two cup, eat about this, that's plenty. Here I have in there. And uh, two eggs, 
I put everything in there. Okay. A little bit of a uh, chopped onion, like about half a cup. Coarsely. So I have potato, onion, eggs. I have to put, that's it. I'll put a little bit of uh, garlic in there too. A couple of cloves of garlic. Just crush it. That's more than enough. Then, a couple of tablespoons of potato starch. I could put regular flour, but I would have to put a little more of potato starch. And half a teaspoon of baking powder. I'll have to put a dash of salt in there, of course. Eggs and, uh, okay, that's it. Reduce that into a puree. That's it. I have beautiful puree of it. Now I'm gonna put that on. Some oil in there, you can put peanut oil or olive oil, any of those. And I'm going to put a little bit of uh, scallion there. You know, for color or scallion, or you may want to put some chives or another type of herbs. So here I am. Okay. And the oil is hot, so you put about a good, well, maybe two tablespoons like this of the mixture. Mm, I have a place close to where I live in France, a three-star restaurant, and they used to do a pancake similar to that, but usually it was done with cooked potato. I do it in some book with like a mashed potato, you know, a cooked potato, and I had flour in it and eggs and all this. And it's similar to this. This is different because everything is raw and done in it. So this is frying beautifully. Now let's see. Uh, I am going to do the dessert here and the dessert au pair in syrup. So I'll take the syrup out. I should have about usually a cup or three quarter of a cup of uh, syrup, so I'll use about half. Half of the syrup should be enough. Then I'll put a couple of tablespoons of apricot, you know, or you can use uh, peach, you know, jam. A couple of tablespoons of butter. That's it in there. One, one and a half tablespoon of butter. And I'm going to put my pear in it and let it cook. And the, the thing is going to reduce into a syrup. And we'll serve that just with the sauce, the syrup on top. And maybe a little bit of uh, whipped cream cheese would be very good. Okay. To so again, a kind of easy dessert, which I often do, because I always have that in my pantry. And when people just show up unexpectedly, here I go, you know. So these are done. They went pretty fast. Whoop. Look how beautiful those are. So you know, those pancakes are quite, as I say, not only beautiful, but I mean filling. So a couple of pancakes, often at home, if I do that, I serve that on a, like, a romaine or frise lettuce, you know, I serve the pancake with it. Okay, that's boiling. Okay, so you have about, well, enough to do about eight, 10 pancakes this way. And you can do them ahead if you want, and then you can reheat them in, uh, in the regular oven. What I do, you know, which is pretty important, is that when those pancakes are done, this is much smaller as you can see, uh, when those pancakes are done, I put them on a wire rack. I learned them from the Korean cook. I used to put them all the time on a paper towel on a plate and realize that the bottom get all soggy right away and the moisture get underneath. So the idea, anything you fry, 
like this, you put it on a wire rack, the air goes underneath, and it stay crisp bottom and top the same way. So here we are. And they are spongy, of course, enough because I have a little bit of baking powder in it. I like them well cooked. Get that right here. They don't really absorb that much oil because I have basically enough oil there to do another batch. Two, three, four. Yes, so I probably would do a dozen, a good dozen with that, of that size. Maybe a dash more of oil. Okay. Good. So this will cook, can reduce the heat here, because I don't want it to cook too, too fast. I really want it to cook inside and it's pretty thick. And I wanted to show you something else now that I do, which is a bit unusual, that I learned it from my friend Jean-Claude. One time I was at his house and he cooks a lot of uh, different salad and all that. And he was cooking kale and uh, other type of, uh, of uh, kind of uh, same type of vegetable, you know, which can be tough sometimes, cook a long time. So he cooked them in the oven. And what he did, take the kale like this, remove it from the, the large rib, that, you know, you can use it in, the, in soup, and put a little bit of salt in there, and oil, a little bit of oil, maybe a, a tablespoon at the most, you know, just so that you toss it and it get, you can put olive oil, of course. You toss it and it gets just slightly oily. And then you put it on a wire rack to cook, just like this, you want to spread it out. You know, it's interesting, and you have to cook them at low temperature, Could I, I kind of figure out the recipe after when we fool around with it, and I cook it at like 400 degrees, even 350, to, and it turned black very fast. So those have to be cooked at 250 degrees. I better turn my potato pancake here. So I'm getting there. Yeah. Up, they stick together, no problem. Okay. Couple of minutes, the pear are doing fine. You see it's reducing. I'm getting to have a thick, heavy syrup. I can actually turn the pear into that syrup here. You don't want to break them. Remember those pears are cooked. But then the butter, and the jam and all that will really improve the taste. Just a bit thicker to caramelize, you know? So that goes into the oven, 250 degrees, no more. 20, 25 minutes, no more. And that's what happened to it, that I have it here. You know, it shrink considerably, and this is very crunchy. I don't know if you can hear that, but I mean, this is crunchy. Uh, absolutely delicious. So serve that with the chili, that's great. I will put it on top of this. Here we are here. At least it's unusual. Great snack. I do it with other type of winter green, actually, but this one works out the best, I think. Okay. All right, so let's see now. I think that my pancakes are cooked, and I think that this is cooked enough as well. You can see it starts sticking. So this, you can put it in the refrigerator to cool it up, transfer it, but I can just leave it around. It's very good at room temperature as well, so I can leave it around to cool off a bit and then serve them like that. We usually I put a bit of cream cheese, whipped cream cheese, or sour cream or something like that in the middle. So this, 
going to have more of those. Mmm. This is good. You know, in that pressure cooker here, the chili has been cooked an hour, an hour and a half, but it's fine. You can always replug it to read it when you need it, but you can really do it ahead. So we're going to have a little bit of uh, cheese with it. And you can have, again, a cheddar cheese or a Monterey Jack. You know, that's basically what people would want to do with it. Oh, here it is. I love cheese with it. And the chili should be hot, hot both way, hot in temperature and hot in taste. Now, I love to serve it in iceberg lettuce, big iceberg lettuce like this, because it's very crunchy, doesn't really have any taste. So you do that for the texture that it has and the coolness, and it's crispy and cool, refreshing. And then I serve red onion with that. You could slice them, up them, but there they are fine, very finely chopped, and they just rinse under cold water. You rinse them under cold water to remove some of the compound of sulfuric acid in it. This is what makes the onion turn color. This is what stings your eyes also. So if you serve an onion raw, like with caviar or with a gar gazpacho or, or carpaccio or uh, something like this, then wash your onion and a bit of cilantro. So here, I have my chili now. Oh, it's beautiful. Boy. So I'm going to do probably a good cup like that of chili in the middle of it. Middle of each of those. Mmm. That's it. We're going to put cheese on top. You can always add more of it. Onion, of course. And finally, you know, spring of cilantro right on top like this. I love cilantro. People love or hate cilantro. I'm one of the lovers. And here it is, the chili con carne. That's it. And now it's time for dessert. And you can see that uh, those have cooled off considerably now. And uh, one of those, you know, are beautiful. You can put it, I mean, uh, hollow side up. Put maybe a little bit of the, this is a, a whipped cream cheese in it, which I love with fruit. You know? And then of course, some of that wonderful sauce here, because remember there is the butter in it. I have butter in it, I have the apricot here of uh, This is, with a cookie like this, this is a simple but really delicious dessert. Here we are, two cookies. When I do the potato pancake, I cannot resist but to have that with a little bit of caviar. This is real caviar, that is sturgeon eggs. And this is a California caviar. I have a paddlefish, there is aquelback paddlefish, different type of sturgeon, as well as the Ocetra sturgeon, which are now raised uh, in California and other parts of the country. Very good quality, and that's what people should buy because uh, the ones from the Baltic Sea or Russia are practically extant and we shouldn't eat it. Now, with that, a uh, beautiful Sauvignon Blanc, which is going to be nice. And this, remember those little potato pancake here with the caviar on top. This is heaven. I mean, my wife will see that and be really jealous because she adores caviar. I'll put a little bit of sour cream on top. And here it is, the best. I love that champagne, vodka, or a good white wine. This is worth doing the whole meal, you know. This was a strange, not really a menu today, with something which can be as elegant as this, and of course the chili con carne, the very crunchy kale, you know, which is great, and that little dessert with pear, which are really delicious. I hope you enjoy the menu that I did today. I enjoy cooking it for you. Happy cooking.
Visit our website at kqed.org slash morefastfoodmyway to learn more about Jacques Pepin. You can watch shows online, view extra clips of Jacques in the Kitchen, print selected recipes from the series, and meet some of the people behind the scenes. Call 1-800-937-5387 or log on to channel9store.com to order the book with over 100 recipes and color photographs for $32 plus shipping or to order the complete series of all 26 shows on DVD for $39.99 plus shipping. Production funding for this series has been brought to you by Cuisinart with the next generation of food processors. From bread dough to pizza to stir fries, we do the work to save you time. Cuisinart, the next generation. And by Scharfenberger, makers of fine artisan dark chocolates, recipes available at scharfenberger.com. And by Spectrum Organics, the purveyor of fine culinary oils and condiments, Spectrum, the taste of goodness. And by OXO Good Grips, makers of kitchen tools that make everyday living easier. A KQED television production.